Well, continue in thanking the Lord for me, for Pastor Steve Riggle and Becky and the tremendous leadership here at Grace Woodlands, Josh and Brooke and all the great team. Well, I put together a book called the Silence Equals Consent, and the idea is that uh, if you're silent at a wedding ceremony, you're giving your consent. Well, if you're silent when they're killing babies, you're giving your consent. And so I'm going to take that apart for you this morning. Um, first, I want to address Christian nationalism. Have you heard of that term? Did you know that nationalism is the opposite of globalism? There are people who want to have a one world government. One was Brock Chisholm, the first director of the World Health Organization. Have you heard of that organization? He said to achieve world government, it is necessary to remove from the minds of men their national patriotism. So globalists do not want people to preserve their nation. How are they going to get their world government? Are people just going to voluntarily surrender? Well, it's called the Great Reset. It's an orchestrated crisis. And so here's Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum. The world must brace for a series of massive unknown crises. Well, how does he know about those? Well, Agenda 2030 video that he released said, you'll own nothing and be happy. Own nothing. That sounds a lot like Karl Marx, who said the theory of communism may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. Well, if you abolish private property, you'll own nothing. So the globalists want world communism. Uh, Jack uh, Posobiec said, uh, the Great Reset is much like communism. They'll tell you it's about diversity, equality, climate, but what, the, what they really want is total government. And uh, the Imprimis magazine, Michael Rechten, well, what is the Great Reset? A two-tiered economy with profitable monopolies and the state on top and socialism for the majority below. So the globalists want world communism. And second, nationalism is good or bad depending on the nation. And in socialist nations, communist, Islamist nations, nationalism is bad because there's no individual rights. Nazi stands for National Socialist Workers Party. There's no individual rights. Ask the Jews. But we're a republic where we believe we have rights from a creator. And the government didn't give them. The government can't take them away. Matter of fact, the government's job is to guarantee to you your creator-given rights. What are these rights? Freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, freedom of a right to trial by your peers, freedom to defend your wife and family, freedom to have no cruel and unusual punishment. Those are sort of good things. And everyone's equal. And to top it all off, you're in charge. Government from the consent of the governed. Really, how could a nation get any better than that? <laughs> you have rights the government can't take away and you're in charge. Well, the um, third thing is nationalism used to be called patriotism. And so if you look at No Webster's 1828 dictionary, the word nationalism not in there. The word patriotism is characteristic of a good citizen, love of one's country. And so here's Washington. To the distinguished character of patriot, it should be our highest glory to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. Uh, Lincoln's inaugural, he said, intelligence, patriotism, Christianity, and a firm reliance on him are still competent to adjust in the best way all our present difficulty. Lincoln mentions patriotism and Christianity right next to each other in his inaugural. And then in the Deep South, they had uh, the Democrats pass Jim Crow laws, black codes, and the start of the KKK. And so you had uh, Tuskegee Institute did research and documented 4,743 documented lynchings. There were more than that, but there were at least that. 1,200 of those were white Republicans in the South registering the freed blacks to vote. And then also starting the Freeman's colleges, right? The, the historical black colleges were all started by guys from the North. And, um, and so Teddy Roosevelt, Republican, was the first president to have a black man in the White House as an honored guest for dinner, Booker T. Washington. And Roosevelt said the mob lynches a Negro. Every Christian patriot in America needs to lift up his voice in loud and eternal protest against the mob spirit. Christian patriots need to get loud against injustice. And then FDR, World War II, he passes out Gideon's New Testaments to all the soldiers in World War II. And uh, he said... As commander in chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces. I wonder if the mainstream media would call Franklin Roosevelt a Christian nationalist. Right? He's defending our nation, he's passing out Bibles. He said, those forces hate democracy and Christianity as two phases of the same civilization. They oppose democracy because it is Christian. They oppose Christianity because it preaches democracy. Eisenhower, any group that awakens all of us is a dedicated patriotic group that can well take the Bible in one hand, the flag in the other, and march ahead. No problem with Bible and flag, right? 
In 1965, 93% of Americans identified themselves as Christian. 93%, 69% Protestant, 24% Catholic, 3% Jewish. So the country was always predominantly Judeo-Christian and patriotic. And did you know that every colony was started by a different Christian denomination? Virginia was Anglican, Massachusetts was Puritan, New York was Dutch Reformed, Connecticut and New Hampshire were Congregational, Delaware was Lutheran and then uh, Dutch Reformed, and then um, New Jersey, Presbyterian, Rhode Island, Baptist, Maryland, Catholic, Pennsylvania, Quaker. You get the picture, and they didn't get along, and they tar and feather each other and chase each other out of each other's colonies, and the revolution starts, and they all get together for a Continental Congress. And uh, John Adams writes, when Congress met, Mr. Cushing made a motion that it should be open with prayer. It was opposed by Mr. Jay of New York and Mr. Rutledge of South Carolina because we were so divided in religious sentiments that we could not join in the same act of worship. Mr. Samuel Adams arose and said he was no bigot and could hear a prayer of any gentleman of piety and virtue who was at the same time a friend of his country. And so they prayed, the country united, and we won the Revolutionary War. God must have known that we're not gonna totally agree with everybody on everything. There's a quote that's attributed to St. Augustine, unity in the essentials, liberty in the non-essentials, and charity throughout it all, right? Love. And so what's the essential? We're sinners. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin, and it's only through Jesus you get to heaven. That's the essentials, right? But we'll have some grace with people on some of the other things. And so here, um, we have two waves or two flavors of these denominations. In the 1600s, the denominations were more leaning in the Puritan direction, the camp, and they pioneered a covenant form of government that turned into our constitution. I'll tell you about it. Um, and then in the 1700s, you had the pietists and they're ones that had a great awakening rev revival. And they're the ones that says, when you get Christian, you should withdraw from worldly things, including government. Wow. So that's where the idea came from, that our church is holier than yours because we're not involved in government. So it's important for us to understand these two waves because they're still having ripple effects on America today. So let's appreciate the Puritans and their covenant form of government. Do you know what the default setting for human government is? If we were to get rid of all the police, you'd have gangs and a gang leader with enough weapons we call a king. A king is just basically a glorified gang leader. And the first gang leader king was Nimrod, Tower of Babel, down the mountain from Mount Ararat where Noah's Ark landed. And uh, he wanted people to fear him more than fear God. The Josephus, the Jewish commentator, said he made everybody in town bake bricks and bring them or he would kill them because he wanted to build a tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. <laughs> And um, since the population of the world was there and he wanted to control it, in a sense, he was the first globalist. Nimrod was the first globalist. He's the first one that wanted to control human population. God comes down, confuses the languages, and the people scatter into language groups that turn into nations. Lo and behold, nations were God's invention to postpone a one world government. But every generation has some Nimrod, Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar that wants to conquer other nations. And if left unchecked, they'd have been happy to conquer them all. And uh, anybody that can plot on a graph sees that at some point it's going to max out on a global level. And Jesus said, wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. And um, now wherever there's a king, you have to believe what the king tells you to believe or you're dead, right? Remember Nebuchadnezzar? And so when the Reformation starts in 1517, you have different countries believing different things than their kings. And so you had Northern Germany and Sweden being Lutheran, Switzerland, Calvinist, Scotland, Presbyterian, Holland, Dutch Reformed, England was Anglican, Italy, Spain, France, Austria, Poland, Catholic, but it was one denomination per country. If you did not believe the way your king did, you were persecuted and you fled. And so there's wars in Europe, um, the king of Spain uh, sends the Iron Duke of Alba to Antwerp, Holland, because they're Dutch Reformed, and he kills 10,000. And then the Queen of France, Catherine de' Medici, uh, she kills 30,000 Dutch uh, Huguenot Protestants, called the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And so you have people believing different than their kings being persecuted by their government. 
And so the um, scholars struggled over what to do with a Bible verse. Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authority. It's like, okay, but what if the governing authority wants to kill your wife and kids, right? Caught them praying the wrong way. And so you had people protesting and they were nicknamed protestants. And one was John Calvin. And he said, we are subject to the men who rule over us, but subject only in the Lord. If they command anything against him, let us not pay the least regard to it. It's sort of like Ephesians 6, children obey your parents. But what if there is a bad parent who tells the kid to sell themselves into prostitution and kill the neighbor? Is the child supposed to obey that parent? No, the child obeys the parent as long as the parent's telling them to do something that lines up with God's word. You obey the government as long as the government's telling you to do something that lines up with God's word. Why would God tell you to do something in his word and then tell you to submit to a government that tells you not to do what he just got done telling you to do? It's um, what Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his letter from the Birmingham jail. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. One has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. You obey the government as long as the government's lining up with the law of God. And so, these Calvinists, John Calvin and his followers, influenced other denominations, and in particular, the Puritans. And they're the ones that pioneered a covenant form of government where you could rule yourselves without a king. And uh, Secretary of Navy George Bancroft, Puritanism has exalted the lady. So let's say there's a bad king, and we work really hard and get rid of him and put in a good king. But then his sons are bad. So now we're back where we started. We work really hard, get rid of that bad king, put in a good king, and his sons are bad. I mean, think of David, the best king ever. His oldest son, Amnon, rapes a daughter, Tamar, is murdered by another son, Absalom, who tries to overthrow David. Another son, Adonijah, tries to overthrow David. Solomon's good for a while until he marries a thousand wives and builds pagan temples. This is the best king David. His own sons go off track. So the brilliance of a covenant form of government is you get rid of the bad king and you maintain order in society without the rubber band snapping back with a new king called the covenant form of government. Puritans got their idea from the Bible, what part of the Bible, that first 400 years out of Egypt before they got a king. It's called the Hebrew Republic from around 1400 BC to 1000 BC. And so um, the, the Puritans were called Christian Hebraists. It's actually in our history. And the later rabbis even quoted from the Puritans because they studied this period of Israel's history before they had a king. And so it worked in Israel because everybody was taught the law and personally accountable to God to follow it. So let's say we get rid of the bad king and you're about to steal something and there's no police. And then you think God's watching me. He wants me to be fair. He's gonna hold me accountable in the future. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. It creates a tiny thing in your head called the conscience. If everybody in the country believes this, you can get rid of the bad king and maintain order in society without the rubber band snapping back with a new king. And it worked until the priests went woke. You're like, what? <laughs> yeah, the high priest Eli, his own sons are sleeping with women in the tent where the Ark of the Covenant is, right? And then you have another Levite with a silver graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. And you're like, aren't these, aren't we not supposed to have graven images? Isn't that a commandment? And then a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite's to marry a virgin of his own tribe and the poor concubine's raped to death by a bunch of sodomites. And by the time you're grossed out, you read this line, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. Why? Because the priest stopped teaching them that there was sin. Right? Oh, just do whatever you want. It's all going to be okay. And um, so it turns into chaos. And they all go to Samuel the prophet and they say the self-government system is not working. We want to be like the other countries, we want a king. Samuel cries and the Lord tells him, they did not reject you, they rejected me. And so they get a King Saul. Saul was pouting that his son Jonathan became friends with David. He turns to his soldiers, he goes, none of you soldiers care. And one soldier, Doeg the Edomite, said, King, I care. I saw David go to this town and the priest there gave him some bread. 
And David said, that's all I need to hear. Tell the priest to come. They show up. He turns to his soldiers and he says, kill him. And the soldiers hesitate. And then Doeg the Edomite goes out there and kills them all. What just happened? The soldiers were still operating under the old system where everybody's accountable to God to follow the law. And the law says you need two or more witnesses before you condemn somebody to death. There's only one witness, Doeg. And they fear God more than they fear the government. And they say, okay, I'm accountable to God. God says there's going to be two witnesses, only one. So sorry, king. And Doeg the Edomite says, king, I'm going to surrender my conscience to your government. You tell me to kill, I'll kill. You tell me to kill the baby in the womb, I'll kill it. Tell me there's no more male and female. Tell me kids can be furries. Whatever you, what are we going to believe today? I'm just a bunch of mush. Right? You blow your trumpet, I'll bow to your statue. I'm going to fear the government more than fear God. And so King Saul is the divider between England and America. The kings of England, they look to the Bible for their authority, but they look to the King Saul and on. Divine right of kings, I'm the royal gang leader. And the Puritans that founded America and then New England, they looked to the pre-King Saul period. Millions of people, everybody taught the law, accountable to God to follow it. Can you see that? Right? They're both looking to the Bible, but the kings of Europe, they want a theocracy. They want dominionism. They want to take control. And the founders of America says, we want freedomism. <laughs> we don't want the government mandating beliefs and canceling you if you don't. And so instead of it being the monarchy where the creator gives the power to the king and he dispenses it to these lowly people below, we skip the king. We say the creator gives the rights to each one of us. And we just choose from amongst ourselves who we want to be in office. And if they don't do it, we tell them to, we fire them and vote in somebody else. And so it's the difference between a dead pyramid top down through fear and a living tree bottom up, right? Everybody's involved. And uh, so the um, first change was in church structure. For a thousand years, you had a hierarchical church structure. They did uh, fight the kings for control of the church. They did hold off the Muslim invasion of Europe and they did preserve the scriptures, but it was a clergy laity model where the clergy does the ministry and the laity is lazy and watches them. It's sort of a spectator religion, right? You watch them do the ministry. The congregational model is where the pastor trains the saints to do the work of the ministry, right? And so, uh, this is why I did not like the COVID response so much because it was changing church structure. Instead of the body getting together, just go home and watch a message on a screen. It can be the best message ever, but you're taken in, you're not given out. Everything that's alive has to take in and give out. Every muscle to grow has to be exercised, right? So the COVID response was just go home and watch the screen where if you get the body together, ministry takes place. Right? The older woman sees the young mom all frazzled. What's wrong, honey? Um, all the kids are sick. Oh, let me pray for you. If you need some food, I can bring it over. And ministry takes it without the pastor having to do it all because he trains the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so this congregational church government, based on the covenant, John Robinson, the pilgrim pastor, we are knit together as a body in covenant of the Lord, tied to care for each other's good. So it's like a prayer meeting. You pray for each other, but you take it the next step and say, I'm going to be there for you. Right? We're family. We're in this. And... Um, so the pilgrims are coming across. We're going to go to Virginia, get blown off course to Massachusetts. And the captain says off the boat because it's winter. And they say, who's going to be in charge? There's 102 of us in the boat. We were going to go to Virginia. N nobody's picked to be in charge. They do something unique. It's called the Mayflower Compact. They take their covenant church form of government and they make it their civil body politic. We in the presence of God covenant ourselves together into a civil body politic, a church group covenanting itself into a political group. It was a polarity change in the flow of power on planet Earth. Set a top-down rule by kings, it's bottom up, just ruled by the 102 of us, right? We, and so Oz Guinness writes, covenantal ideas in England were the lost cause, but they became the winning cause in New England. Covenant-shaped constitutionalism. The American Constitution is a nationalized, secularized form of covenant. Covenant lies behind constitution, and the word federal is Latin for covenant. And so, King James says, I will make them conform themselves or I will harry them out of the land. And so you had the great Puritan migration, 20,000 flooding into New England, and you had pastors and churches founding cities. A pastor, John Lothrop, and his church founded Barnstable, Massachusetts. A pastor, Roger Williams, and the first Baptist church in America founded Providence, Rhode Island. Pastor John Wheelwright and his church founded Exeter, New Hampshire, and a pastor, Thomas Hooker, and the first Congregationalist church in America founded Hartford, Connecticut. Churches founding cities, right? This is unique on the planet. At this time in history, you have 
nearly 5,000 years of Chinese emperors, Korean emperors, Japanese emperors, Indian Maharajas, Russian czars, Mongolian khans, Muslim sultans, African chieftains, kings of Spain, France, and Austria, the whole world's kings. And here in New England, you got this little greenhouse where churches are founding cities. And so uh, I go through Thomas Hooker and his church asks him to preach a sermon on how to set up government. He gives a sermon in 1638, foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. This is reflected in our declaration, government from the consent of the governed. And this is different from the rest of the world because the Muslim sultans did not ask the people for their consent. Chinese emperors did not ask the people for their consent, right? Russian czars, no, right? But in America, we get to give consent to how we're being ruled. And so uh, his sermon's written down, it's called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, and they use it for nearly two centuries as the Constitution of Connecticut. And so there's a plaque, Thomas Hooker, founder of the state of Connecticut, father of American democracy, statue of Thomas Hooker holding a Bible, at the base of the statue leading his people through the wilderness, he founded Hartford. On this side, he preached the sermon, which inspired the fundamental orders, first written constitution that created a government. Another plaque, here minister Thomas Hooker, peerless leader in New England thought and life in both church and state. He's a minister speaking on church stuff and state stuff. Here's another plaque, Thomas Hooker, a leader, a preacher, statesman who based all civil authority on the free consent of the people. And then another plaque, it says, Thomas Hooker preached his famous sermon, foundation of authority is laid in the free consent of the people. The people adopt his sermon as the fundamental orders. What do they say? The people can join ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth. Who are the people? It's Thomas Hooker and the first Congregationalist church in America. So you have a church group conjoining itself into a public state. Now, why did they do that? To preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They didn't want a government mandating beliefs top down. They wanted the liberty of the gospel. And it goes back to God is love. He wants you to love him back. But for love to be loved, it must be voluntary, right? If, if you're being forced, then it's not love. And so the, um, another plaque, this one says, Thomas Hooker's congregation established the form of government upon which the present constitution of the United States is modeled. Do you grasp this? Our constitution based on the New England church government, based on the Bible, what part of the Bible that first 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul, right? This is before the age of enlightenment or any of these are pastors and churches founding cities. And so in New England, instead of separation of church and state, it was the pastors and churches that created the state. Amen. How can you say pastor don't preach on politics when it's the pastor's sermon, that's the constitution. Mm -hmm. How can you say church members don't get involved in politics when all there was in Hartford was the church members. Right? There's no non-church members. Matter of fact, the word polis means city and politics is simply the business of the city. And all there was in the city, Hartford was the church, right? So everybody's involved in church. Everybody's involved in city government because it's the church founding the city, right? There's no non-church members tagging along to be lazy and let them run stuff. Everybody's involved in church. Everybody's involved in the city government. And so they had one building in town called the Meeting House. That's where the pastor would teach the Bible and that's where they'd do their city business. The word synagogue means meeting house. That's where the rabbi would teach the law and that's where they would do their city business. Why build a separate building just to talk about a different topic? And so when the revolution starts, the British send over a military governor, Thomas Gage, and he outlaws meeting houses. Democracy is too prevalent in America. We don't need the people meeting and giving your consent to stuff. You just obey government mandates. And we're like, no, nothing happens in America unless we give our consent. He's like, no, you obey government mandates. We're like, no, nothing happens in America unless we give our consent. He's like, no, you're a robot, you're a zombie. When the government blows the trumpet, you bow to the statue. We're like, no, nothing happens in America unless we give our consent. Turns into a revolutionary war and we win. And we set up a government where it's we, the people, government from the consent of the governed. So Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authority. Romans 13 is understood differently in a monarchy versus a republic. In a monarchy, subjects submit to the king. In a republic, the citizens are the king. The word citizen comes from the Greek. It means co-ruler, co-sovereign, co-king. We pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic. We're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves. 
So when somebody protests the flag, what they're saying is, I don't want to be the king anymore. I protest this system, right? And um, so um, that's the 1600s. Remember, we talked about these two waves having ripples. And after a century, it got a little dry. And they taught it academically at Yale and Harvard. God has a plan for your life, marriage, family, church, government. Find out what the plan is, put it into place. Some took it the next step and said, God, in his infinite wisdom, already knows who's going to wind up in heaven. So don't even bother preaching the gospel. Whoever's supposed to get saved, they'll get saved. And they became less evangelistic. And so they got nicknamed Old Lights. And so David Brainerd got expelled from Yale because he said his professor was as spiritual as a chair. <laughs> and so in the 1700s, you have the new lights. And these are revivalists, First Great Awakening Revival. And they said, look, it's more than a plan, even if it's a good plan. You have to have an experience with Jesus. And when you do, your life will change. And you won't do worldly things anymore, like bars and brothels and lewd theater and get involved in government. Wait, what was that last thing? Yeah, government, it's worldly. If you're really Christian, you're not going to be involved. It's like, huh, that's sort of different than the entire century of the 1600s where everybody's involved in church and everybody's involved in city government because it's the church founding the city. Yeah, so yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. If you're really spiritual, you'll withdraw from government. That's where that idea came from, that our church is a little more spiritual than your church because we don't get involved in politics. We just preach the gospel. We're like, we're like so holy. And so we got to take apart where the pietists came from. So we compare Puritans had a covenant plan, but to some it was only a plan and it became spiritually dry. Pietists, it's a personal faith, but to some it was so personal, it was only personal and they would withdraw from government and not care what kind of country they're leaving their kids. And so where did pietists come from? Martin Luther starts the Reformation. He had a personal experience, the Joshua by faith. He stands up to the most powerful guy in the world, Charles V, and he tells him to his face, unless you can prove me wrong from scripture, here I stand, so help me God. Very personal to Martin Luther. But some German princes said, this is the chance I've been waiting for to break away from Rome. Kingdom of mine, I just made the decision, you're all Lutherans. And the people in these kingdoms are like, okay, okay, we're Lutheran. Um, what do we believe? So for the people in the kingdom, it's not necessarily the same personal experience Martin Luther had. It's just a new state doctrine. And so this revival movement starts called pietism. They said being a Christian is more than doctrine, even if it's good doctrine. You have to have an experience with Jesus. And when you do, your life will change and you won't do worldly things anymore like bars and brothels and government. It turned into the German concept of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the government, the kingdom of the church, the two don't touch. So where the Puritan says you can do two things. You, did you know you can do two things? You can be a spouse and you can be a parent. Two completely different roles. One person can do both. You can be involved in church stuff. You can be involved in city government stuff. One person can do both. But the pietists are like, no, no, no. You can only do one. And if you're really spiritual, you'll withdraw from the government and only be involved in church stuff. Well, that brings up an interesting scenario because if all the spiritual people withdraw from government, who's left to be involved but the less spiritual? And because they're less spiritual, they're going to yield to their ambitions, become power hungry and turn into tyrants. It's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Don't get involved in government because it's worldly. Well, why is it worldly? Because we're not involved in government. <laughs> all the spiritual people have withdrawn themselves. It's like, duh. And so the... Um, uh, four centuries of that two kingdom teaching in Germany allowed Hitler to put Jews on train cars and they're going right past the church crying out for help. And the church's response was, well, that's the government that's killing the Jews and we can't get involved because we're holy. And so let's just sing praise songs to Jesus louder. It's like, can anybody see there's something wrong with that picture? And um, now I do give credit where credit's due. The pietists did spread that it is a personal relationship with Jesus. And they went from this little area of Germany and they were called Moravians and they sent missionaries around the world. Some of them were on a boat going to Georgia. On the boat were the Wesleys and John Wesley's panicking because the boat's about to sink. And these Moravians are just singing praise songs to Jesus. And he's like, you guys have a personal experience with Jesus that I don't have. Wesley sort of fail in Georgia, go back to England. They're invited to another Lutheran pietist prayer meeting 
And John Wesley said, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. And then he said he felt his heart strangely warmed. He said about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John Wesley had a personal experience with Jesus. He went and lived with the Moravians for eight months, called it the religion of the heart. He comes back to England and he starts a revival movement inside of the Anglican church called Methodism, very similar to the pietist revival movement inside of the Lutheran church. And he said, it's more than Anglican doctrine, even if it's good doctrine, you have to have an experience with Jesus. And he gets his friend, George Whitfield involved, who preaches up and down the colonies seven times. It's called the Great Awakening Revival. It was great. People were having experience with Jesus, right? Whitfield was the first one to preach to mixed crowds, right? People of all races. And uh, the blacks that heard him and got saved wrote the Negro spirituals, those famous songs that we sing and have made a great impact on the country. And um, so this is spreading around. Ben Franklin prints George Whitfield's sermons. And, but some, it's personal, but it's only personal. And they would withdraw from politics. And so one was the founder of the Lutheran Church in America, Henry Muhlenberg. And he's a pietist. He's got two pietist pastor sons. John Peter, Frederick Augustus, and the revolution starts. John Peter hears Patrick Henry's give me liberty, give me death speech, and he wants to help. And George Washington says, I'll make you a colonel, go get your men. So he goes to church and he preaches a sermon out of Ecclesiastes, time for all things, gather stones, scatter stones, time to preach, time to fight. And he takes off his clerical robe and underneath he has a uniform of a continental officer, leads 300 men of his church to become the 8th Virginia Regiment, He's promoted to general. He's elected to Congress, and his statue is in the U.S. Capitol, taken off his clerical robe with a uniform. Well, his brother Frederick is writing him letters, saying, you have become too involved in matters which, as a preacher, you have nothing whatsoever to do. John Peter writes back, accusing Frederick of being a Tory British sympathizer. Frederick writes back and says he could not serve two masters. Right? Kingdom to two kingdoms, kingdom of the government, the kingdom of the church. I can't serve both, so I'm going to withdraw and only be involved in church stuff. And then the British invade New York and burn Frederick's church. And as he's watching his church get burnt down, he says, maybe I do need to get involved. He gets elected to Congress and he gets elected the first speaker of the House. The first speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives is a pastor, Lutheran pastor Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. And what did he pass with his brother, John Peter there? The First Amendment. Does anybody honestly think that these two pastors would vote to outlaw themselves? Pastors aren't supposed to be involved in politics, even though we are pastors and we're, we're passing the First Amendment. No, the First Amendment, as well as the first 10 amendments, were handcuffs on the federal government to keep it from becoming a monster like King George III, ruling through mandates, canceling people if they don't surrender their consciences, putting them in J6 jails if they don't right, surrender. And so the idea is that we wanna be involved. So why can't we have a middle of the road? Why can't we have a covenant plan where we rule ourselves and have a personal experience with Jesus? It is personal. Thank God Jesus died on the cross for each one of us. But don't we want to leave a nation to our children where they have a chance to have a personal experience with Jesus? Because if you don't get involved, what they are teaching the kids in those public schools is there is no God. Would God want the children to be taught he didn't exist? And if they think he exists, they come to the conclusion he's messed up. He's putting men in women's bodies. You have to have operations to fix it. What a messed up God. He's either confused up there or powerless or worse. He's doing it on purpose. He's sadistic. And if that behavior is not sin, what behavior? Well, sex outside of marriage. You know the little library books they show the kids? Try this kind of sex. Try that kind of sex. If sex outside of marriage is not a sin, arguably there are no sins. And if there's no sins, you certainly don't need a savior to save you from your sins. So they're undermining the entire gospel. There's no God. There's no sin. There's no savior. I mean, you have to admit, it's a pretty clever trick the devil's pulled to get Christians who believe the gospel of Christ let their children be taught the gospel of Antichrist. Yes. We're not going to get involved in politics. We're just going to enjoy our own personal relationship with Jesus. We're sort of selfish and we're not going to care that our kids are being taught there's no God, there's no sin, and there's no need for a savior. 
Well, it's like, you're really spiritual, aren't you? And um, so the most important thing is to bring people to Christ. But the second most important thing is to preserve the freedom to do the most important thing. If you really believe the gospel is the answer, you're going to be involved wanting the freedom to preach it because the other side is coming after our freedoms. I just read last week where a fire chief in California went to uh, some ongoing training classes that were hosted inside of a church. There was not a church service. It was just hosted there. They fired him. And now he's bringing a lawsuit to try to get his job back. I mean, firing people just because they walked into a church building? And um, so to those who think they're holy by not being involved in politics, I have a question. What do you do with Numbers chapter 30? It's the silence equals consent chapter of the Bible. Half a dozen scenarios. One, if a daughter binds herself with a vow while living in her father's house in her youth and her father hears her vow and holds his peace, then all of her vows shall stand. But if her father overrules her, on the day that he hears, then none of her vows shall stand and the Lord will release her. That's come down to us as vows in a wedding ceremony. And the pastor tells the church members, if you are silent when you hear these wedding vows, you're giving your consent, right? If anyone present knows any reason this couple shall not be joined together in holy matrimony, speak now or forever hold your peace. If you're at the wedding and you're holding your peace and you're being silent, you're actually giving consent to the wedding. It's called the rule of tacit admission, T-A-C-I-T, Black's Law Dictionary, an admission reasonably inferable from a party's failure to act or speak. It's in criminal law. It's in debt collection law. Somebody owes you money. You wait 10 years to try to start collecting. The judge will say you're past the statute of limitations. You've been silent too long. No money. It's in real estate law. You save up money, buy a rent house for some retirement income, and a squatter moves in. And if you know about it and you're silent, they can gain title to your rent house through adverse possession just by you being silent. It's in trademark law. You design a trademark. Somebody copies it. It's all over the internet. If you do not try to defend your trademark and you're silent, they all get to use it. It's in our Constitution. Article 1, Section 7, Congress passes a bill, puts it on the president's desk. If any bill shall not be returned by the president within 10 days, the same shall be a law in like manner as if he had signed it. All the president has to do is let it sit there and be silent for 10 days and his silence equals his signature. So if a church member's silence gives consent to wedding vows, it gives consent to other things. And if they're killing babies in the community and the church members are silent, they're giving their consent to killing babies. And if you give consent, you're an accessory and you'll share in the judgment. Leviticus 20, any Israelite who sacrifices any of his children to Molech's to be put to death. If the members of the community close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Molech, I myself will set my face against him and his family and will cut them off from their people together. All you have to do is be silent. Last year, there was a bill, uh, two years ago in California, where the police were told not to investigate if a baby dies within 28 days after birth. And the pro-life Catholics and the California Family Council said, that's terrible wording for a bill. Somebody could smother their kid to death. And, and so the Christians said, we can't be silent. And they go to Sacramento and they force them to amend it. You know, Paul was talking to the Lord. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death. Paul did not throw a stone. Paul did not say a word. But Paul knew he was guilty for the death of Stephen just by standing back silent. Proverbs 24, rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to death. Don't stand back and let them die. Don't try to disclaim responsibility by saying you didn't know about it. For God, who knows all hearts, knows yours, and he knows you knew, and he will repay everyone according to his deeds. Mordecai tells Esther, there's a mandate from the government to kill the Jews. If you remain silent, Deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Numbers 20, Moses and Aaron are called to the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord spake to Moses, take the rod, gather the assembly, thou and Aaron speak to the rock and it shall give forth water. Well, they gathered the assembly. Moses lifted up his hand and with his rod, he smote the rock twice and water came out abundantly. End of the chapter. And the Lord spake to Moses, Aaron will not enter the land because both of you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. 
It's like both. We just read the chapter. Aaron didn't say a word the whole chapter. It's like, yeah, that's just it. He was at the door of the tabernacle. He heard God tell Moses, speak to the rock. When Moses lifted up the rod the first time and hit the rock, it probably took Aaron by surprise. When Moses lifted up the rod the second time, Aaron knew what was coming and he did not protest. He was silent. And in that instant, Aaron was guilty. Moses's was a sin of commission. Aaron's was a sin of omission. Leviticus 5, a person sins because he did not speak up. Even though he was an eyewitness to a case or knew what happened, anyone who failed to testify, he is guilty. Martin Luther King, he who accepts evil without protesting it is really cooperating with it. We all have this verse memorized. Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know the verse immediately before it? Confront your neighbor directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. They're loving each other, loving each other. They're confronting each other. Why? Because there was no king. There was no police for 400 years. There's nobody to report your neighbor to. Everybody's taught the law. Everybody helps enforce the law. It's like a parent. You love your kid. You love your kid. But every now and then you got to correct your kid. Israel, they're loving their neighbor, they're loving their neighbor, but every now and then you got to correct your neighbor. <laughs> and another translation, rebuke your neighbor directly and you will not incur guilt because of him. Proverbs 9, rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Proverbs 24, whoever says to the wicked, you're in the right, will be cursed. But those who rebuke the wicked will have delight and a good blessing will come upon them. Proverbs 27, open rebuke is better than secret love. Proverbs 28, he that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flatters with the tongue. Ecclesiastes 7, better to hear the rebuke of the wise than the song of fools. Isaiah 1, rebuke the oppressor, obtain justice for the orphan, plead the widow's case. Luke 17, if your brother sin, rebuke him. 1 Timothy 5, them that sin, rebuke before all. Titus 1, there are many unruly vain talkers who subvert whole households, wherefore rebuke them sharply. Titus 2, these things speak, exhort, rebuke with all authority. 2 Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke. Now you can do it nicely. 1 Timothy 5, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and younger men as brethren. What does entreat mean? It doesn't mean being silent. It just means you're polite and respectful, but you're speaking the truth in love. So the left has a woke tactic and it's to guilt trip Christians into being more Christian than Christ. You say, what? They say, yeah, if you're really Christian, you will be silent and give your tacit approval to us teaching something to children that Jesus would never teach to children. I mean, would Jesus teach the trans agenda? We know what Jesus taught, Matthew 19. He who made them at the beginning made them male and female. If they're telling you, if you're really Christian, you'll be silent. You'll give her tacit approval to us teaching something to kids that Jesus would never teach. So if you're really Christian, you won't act like Christ. I mean, think of it. Here are school counselors who cannot even define woman. Yet they think they can tell that the little boy is supposed to be a little girl. It makes no sense. And Jesus warned, if you cause one of these little ones who trust me to fall into sin it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone around your neck. So I think it's going to be a rude awakening for all those church members who think they're being spiritual by not getting involved in politics when they realize by their silence, they're giving consent to all the wicked stuff out there. They're inviting the judgment of God on their heads. You know, a scriptural case can be made that God cares about children. Can we all agree about that? God cares about children. And so the answer is local, local, local. Did you know there's more people that go to church in an area than vote in a school board race? And the answer is as easy as saying, look, we don't agree with every church on every doctrine, but none of us are happy with what they're teaching. Let's just vote some mama bear in. And you got some great ones right here at Grace Woodlands. Let's just vote some mama bear in and then show up at the school board meeting to show our support. And, you know, we used to care about all the kids in the neighborhood, not just the ones that attended. Remember a generation ago, we had bus programs and bus captains. I was at a meeting and a lady who was 50 years old, she got saved at eight years old because a Baptist church had a bus come by and took her to, she heard a Sunday school and they talked about Jesus and she got saved. We used to care about all the kids. In the, shouldn't we care about what all the kids are being taught in the school? Yes. And um, if churches can just care about the children, I mean, just make it first step. Just care about the children. 
if churches can just care about school board races, I'm convinced all the higher races will take care of themselves. The people that want to run for a higher race will say, oh, well, this is how you knock on doors. This is how you make phone calls. This is, these are the deadlines, right? And um, it's so easy now because there are groups that can help out. And um, I'm convinced that, uh, that if the, we got such a great person here, Kathy, right? She's got, got a table in the lobby. And, and so you can just go out there and just say, hey, I want to get involved. And, um, and now here's an observation. Remember we started off talking about globalists? Remember way back when, when I started my talk, globalists? As more power concentrates into fewer hands globally, God's counterbalance is to get more people involved locally. Let me say that again. As more power concentrates into fewer hands globally, God's counterbalance is to get more people involved locally. I'm convinced God wants to have an end time revival, but it's not going to be through one or two big name preachers. It's going to be through the body of Christ being the body of Christ, everybody participating in eye and ear, a foot, right? Everybody getting involved. And, um, and maybe even if we can't turn around, maybe God's letting the evil be exposed to expose the condition of our hearts. How much will we stomach? I mean, what will it take to get people to do something? We all see these articles, male field hockey player on female team knocks out girl's teeth. Another male student who identifies as transgender injures three girls during a basketball game, causing forfeit. You know, and some people say, I'm not going to do anything because all the politicians are corrupt. Well, unless Jesus himself is on the ballot, we're all sinners. All right. And, um, and then some people say, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to wait for the rapture. I have a question for you. Who do you think you're going to meet when you're raptured? Uh, Jesus. Does Jesus love the little children? Oh, yes. Jesus loves the little children. You think he might wonder why you didn't do anything to protect them? I mean, we're not in China or North Korea where you don't vote. We're in America where the citizen is the king. The politicians are your servants. You tell them what to do. And even if we can't turn around, shouldn't we at least try? You know, there's a praise song, beautiful, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And there's a line in the song, break my heart for what breaks yours, everything I am for the kingdom's cause. I thought, what an interesting line to put in a praise song. Do you think it breaks Jesus' heart to have these little innocent children lied to and mutilated? And then there's sex trafficking. Jim Caviezel did the movie Sound of Freedom. There's a line in the movie that kids are the new cocaine. He says, you smuggle cocaine in a country, you sell it one time. You smuggle a kid in, you can sell them 10 times a day. It's heartbreaking. Where's the church? And now we're finding that hundreds of thousands of children are missing coming across the border. And there's evidence that they're being put into sex trafficking. I was in Colorado earlier this year and met the re state representative, Scott Bottoms. He talked to sheriffs and found out that there's wicked people buying children for sex. So he introduced a bill just for minimum punishment for those caught selling children. It gets voted down. Where's the church? California earlier this year, Shannon Grove, a state senator, introduced a bill to make purchasing a child for sex a felony versus a misdemeanor with as little as two days in jail. It gets voted down. And the Democrat state senator, Susan Eggman, gets on the floor and rebukes her own party. She goes, I'm a social worker. I've worked with women who've been abused as children. They get wounded. They have to deal with it their whole lives. And you're more concerned about this guy that's going to go out and do it again in two days. I've had enough. Where's the church? Amen. You know, the Salvation Army was started with William and Catherine Booth rescuing children out of sex trafficking. In London, bad people would go to a poor family and say, give us your daughter, we'll give her an education. They get her out the door, they sell her into a brothel. When Catherine Booth found out about it, she says, I felt as though I must go and walk the streets and besiege the dens where these hellish iniquities are going on to keep quiet seemed like being a traitor to humanity. So what does the silence say about the condition of our hearts? We, well, we don't wanna get involved in politics. They're selling children and you don't wanna get involved? Right? They're lynching blacks. You don't want to get involved. They're killing Jews and you don't want to get involved. Jesus warned in the last days because evil shall abound. The love of many will wax cold. God gave Ezekiel a vision. He cried, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Behold, six men came, every man with a destroying weapon in his hand. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had the rider's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city. Put a mark on the foreheads of those who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. To the others, he said, go after him through the city, slay old and young, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and begin at my sanctuary. What's the difference between being slain and not? Does your heart sigh and cry over the abominations that are done in your city? I believe yours does. 
I believe that's why you're here. I believe you know there's something on the inside of you that says, I just can't be silent anymore. You know, since COVID, fewer Christians are sharing their faith. And so if we're not going to play a good offense, at least let's play a good defense. If we're not taking serious winning the world for Christ, at least don't keep your mouth shut when they want to mutilate a little kid. You know, we have to be like Jesus. But Jesus did not pet lambs all day long. Did you know Jesus' first sermon ended with them wanting to push him off a cliff? Another sermon ends with them picking up stones to stone him. Another sermon ends with people saying, this is a difficult saying, who can bear it? And they stand up and walk out of church. They walk with him no more. He didn't run after him and say, oh, you misunderstood me. No, he turns to 12, says, you want to go too? There's the door. And Peter said, where else can I go? You're the only one with the words of eternal life. Jesus is invited to dinner. The Pharisee noticed he didn't wash his hands. And Jesus said, you Pharisees are more concerned about the outside of the cup and not the inside. You're like a sepulcher, pretty on the outside, inside full of dead men's bones. And the lawyer says, well, Jesus, by saying that, you're insulting us lawyers. He goes, let me tell you about your lawyers. You heap burdens on people too heavy to carry. Don't even lift a finger. You hold the keys of knowledge. You don't go in. You don't let anybody else in. And he lays into them. And then the chapter ends. And you wonder if they ever got around to eating dinner. You sort of get the feeling he pushed him out on the street. This is our loving Jesus. To the prideful, he was tough. To the humble, he was as loving as can be. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Now, if we tone down our preaching because we're afraid of the negative response, we'll have toned it down so much there won't be a positive response. There won't be any conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah. And of course, Peter said thou art the Christ. But if you think of it, who is John the Baptist? He stood up to the corrupt government leader, Herod. Who was Elijah? He stood up to the corrupt government leaders, Ahab and Jezebel. Who was Jeremiah? He stood up to the corrupt government leaders, King Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. We're social creatures. We want to be accepted. We don't want to be rejected. It's in our DNA. Little kids, they want to be accepted in school and wear the right tennis shoes. And right? nobody wants to be left off the team. We're social creatures. Peter's with a group and he's about to get kicked out. He's around a fire. And a girl says, you're with Jesus. And you can just picture Peter looking around the fire, everybody's eyeing him. And he says, I never met the guy. It's like, that's it, Peter? You cave that fat? It is a real fear to be kicked out of a group, a family group, a professional group, of a friendship group, to be, to be canceled. It hurts. It hurts to have them post something negative about you on the internet. But after the resurrection, Peter's called into the Sanhedrin. And they said, we gave you strict orders not to speak in his name, or we're going to kick you out of this group, the synagogue. And Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. It's like, what happened to Peter? Now he doesn't care about being kicked out of a group. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. I think maybe one of the evidences of being filled with the Holy Spirit is having the boldness to speak out. You just can't be quiet. You got to speak the gospel. But you also got to defend the innocent, rescue the orphan, the widow, stand up for these little kids. Amen. God told Jeremiah, be not afraid of their faces. I'm with thee to deliver thee. Tell them everything I tell you to say. Do not be afraid of them, or I will make you look foolish in front of them. Jeremiah, then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak in his name anymore, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I could not stay. I could not keep quiet. And so God tells the children of Israel, Exodus 23, neither shall you follow the multitude in doing evil. There will be a multitude, they will be doing evil, and you're supposed to be the stick in the mud. Somebody might say, well, I'm not going to do anything, but God knows my heart. Like, well, he knew Abraham's heart, didn't he? But he still wanted to see Abraham do something. Take his beloved son Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah. Imagine a guy watching football. And you say, when was the last time you told your wife you love her? And he's like, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, okay. When was the last time you did anything to show your wife you love her? It's like, uh, I can't remember, but she knows my heart. It's like, dude, we need to have a little marriage counseling here. <laughs> People say, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. And he wants to hear some words out of your mouth and see some actions. We're spiritual beings in a physical world. God led the children of Israel in the wilderness. Why? To prove them to know what was in thine heart. To see whether they would keep his commandments or no. So we're the bride of Christ. And every romance novel builds up to a decision-making moment of forsaking of all others and choosing the one. I think God is pushing the world to a decision-making moment. He's making the choice really clear. It's like, okay, we're getting close to the end times and um, uh, I'm not going to force you because you're not a robot, right? It's you choose, but I'm going to make it really clear. I'm going to pull back the curtain and show evil. So I've never seen before Satan clubs on elementary school campuses, Disney FX having a little demon Satan cartoon. 
Satan worshiping Grammys, Satan trans clothes designers for Target, Satan statues in the Iowa State Capitol, and we all saw the Olympic opening mocking Christ. It's almost like God's pulling back the curtain and saying, okay, Satan, like the Wizard of Oz, you know, they pull back the curtain, you see his old man, you're not afraid of him anymore. God's like, okay, I need you to make your choice. I'm going to pull back the curtain. God, devil, choose. And some people, like a cell splitting, some people are going to do evil. And some people are going to be silent in the face of evil. And by their silence, they are giving their tacit approval to the evil. And there are some of us that say, you know what? I was silent for a long time, tolerated something I didn't feel good about. And then I stretched the rubber band and tolerated something else I didn't feel good about. But I'm sorry, I can't be silent when they want to do a hysterectomy on a little eight-year-old girl because she went through a tomboy phase. I'm sorry, I can't be silent when they want to castrate a little boy because he played with his sister's dolls and they cut the rubber band and it snaps. You know, I um, love this quote from Jonathan Trumbull. He was a Connecticut governor. To, he wrote to George Washington, in this day of calamity, the trust altogether to the justice of our cause without our utmost exertion would be tempting providence. So we trust, we pray and we trust, but then we give our utmost exertion. So in closing, I just want to remind you that, that someday you're going to be dead. So thanks for coming. And, uh, but you're going to be in heaven because you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun with no less days to sing his praise than when we just begun, imagine you have been in heaven for 10,000 years. You're walking the streets of gold. You meet Moses. Maybe Moses will invite you over to his place. I don't know what it's like in heaven, but Jesus said in my father's house, there are many mansions, many dwelling places. I bet Moses will have a pretty nice place. He might even have one of those big fireplaces where the logs don't burn up. Get at the burning bush in the wilderness, didn't burn up, and the logs in his fireplace didn't burn up. I heard one preacher say, in heaven, you'll travel as fast as you think. And I'll probably show up late. <laughs> My wife will say, where were you? I was thinking about something else. I don't know. But imagine we all finally get there. We've got a big living room at Moses' house. And after the small talk's over, he's sitting right in front of you. You reach over, tap him on the shoulder, say, Moses, tell us a story. I read the book. I even saw the movie. But here you are in person. Room gets quiet. Moses stands up and he says, it looked bad. The government was wanting to kill us. We were totally unarmed. And I just stood there with my staff and said, God, use me to deliver your people. And the waves came in and swallowed up Pharaoh's chariots. We're going to say, wow. Then we're going to look around the room and see David. David, tell us your story. And David said, well, it looked bad. This Goliath, this monster, and all these grown-ups are too scared and chicken to do anything. I said, enough of that. Took my little sling, hit him in the head, took his own sword and chopped his head off. We're going to say, Wow. And then we're going to go around. There's Esther. Whether I die, I die. I'm going to go and see the king and, and Gideon and the apostle Paul. And then everyone in the room is going to look at you. So you, we haven't heard your story yet. Tell us, what did you do when it was your turn to be down there on earth? What were they saying about God in your country? Or the baby and the, the Lord knew in the mother's womb or sex that God made them in the beginning, male and female. What did you do when the whole world was against you and the government was coming and they're all sitting on the edge of their seats? What are you going to say? You know, I'd hate for any of us to be up there and Jesus walk in the room and a big screen come down and sh him show all kinds of great things happening, people coming to the Lord and him saying, this is what I had planned for you to do down on earth, but you just didn't have enough faith and courage. And you look back at your life and that mountain that held you back was a tiny little anthill, little fear of man. You say, I let that fear of man hold me back from doing all this great stuff for Jesus? And you can't go back to earth and do anything else for Jesus because you're already in heaven because you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. But guess what? We're still on this earth. We still have breath in our lungs. We still have feet that trod the soil. You still can do those great, courageous, faith-filled things that you'll be known for forever. It's like a basketball game. Jesus is the coach. You're on the bench. He comes over and slaps you on the back and says, your turn, get in the game. And you're like, but coach, they're playing really tough out there. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know. It's your turn. Get in the game. He's like, but coach, somebody's got knocked down. He goes, you're seven feet tall. They're four feet tall. You can do this. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raise up a standard against him. Go a thousand fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand shall not come nigh thee. Out of all of world history, the good Lord decided for you to be alive right now. He knows every globalist, dirty backroom deal. He knows all of that. And he thinks you've got what it takes. He's given you his word. He's given you his Holy Spirit. He's given you great pastors like Pastor Steve. He's given it to you. And all of heaven is sitting on the edge of their seats. 
Instead of it being, oh, God, looks bad, coming quick. It's like, no, they send in the best player. No coach saves his best player till the end. He saves the fastest runner to run the last leg of the relay. He saves the best batter, right? Bases loaded, put in Babe Ruth. God has sent you specifically to the earth for this time so you can be bold and courageous and carry out his will. God bless you.